Morning all. So um, I'm going to give you a brief, very brief tour about some of the stuff we do from a, a BT protection perspective, a little bit about some of the threats that we face, um, some of the things that we've been doing recently, how we're responding to that, uh, and also then a little bit of a, of a, 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 a little bit of IPv6, not a lot, not a lot. Um, a little and IPv6 don't normally go together very well, do they? So, um, from, a, from a kind of an attacker perspective, I'm going to start with the attackers because I always like starting with the attackers and the cyber viewpoint. So, from our perspective, kind of looking at understanding what's going on in the world of cyber, um, understanding the criminal mindset, very much uh, looking from a kind of entrepreneurship in terms of how criminals are starting to think, how they're starting to exploit capabilities. Uh, the speed at which things are now starting to kind of move in the cyber world is actually dri you know, driving us to, do, to think about how we do stuff in a, in a different model, in a different mindset. The need to be able to respond rapidly to th kind of growing threats, uh, the need to move at pace is becoming more and more important in the world that we're, uh, we're kind of facing and the threats we're facing out there. So some, I'm not going to talk through all the points on the slides. You can, you can kind of read some of those as I, as I talk around them. But... Just to, just to kind of look at some of the things that worry us from a BT perspective. Um, so I guess five key areas that, that you know, are our key focus. Uh, so starting off really from the, from the world of hacktivism, something we view as kind of moderate risk you know, facing at BT, uh, thinking about kind of issues around disruption of our services, defacement of public facing portals, all those sort of things that, that are there to essentially undermine the brand and cause impact to uh, it's a service we offer from our customers. Um, criminals, um, criminal, criminal sector for us, uh, our kind of high risk area. Uh, lots of stuff we deal with with very sensitive data, both our customers and some of our, some of our bigger um, commercial contracts as well. Um, lots of stuff around the things that we're doing, what we're investing in, all those sort of things that are actually very valuable uh, in the marketplace. Uh, to, to the criminals who may want to sell it on, may want to exploit that data in, in a variety of different ways. Um, and in the criminal space, we, we see an awful lot of, our, of abuse around our customer credentials as well, high volume of, of fraud activity around customer credentials, so big area of focus that we spend looking at kind of that sector. And then we've got terrorists, again, moderate risk. We've, we've, we've spent a lot of time on the physical side of, of terrorists um, and dealing with that now from, for many, many years with the challenges that we've faced um, historically with, with, between the UK and Northern Ireland, um, which has actually driven quite a lot of stuff we do around pre preparing for physical attacks on infrastructure. But actually now starting to think about cyber terrorism as well. What does cyber terrorism mean? How do we understand? How do we react to that sort of stuff? At the moment, for us, deemed a kind of moderate risk that we're worrying about. Um, and then last, last of the four quadrants, nation state. Um, so for us as a UK CNI provider, um, you know, uh, the risk to us from nation state perspective is actually very high. Um, we are constantly getting probed from a nation state perspective across our infrastructure, trying to find holes, trying to find ways in uh, and trying to exploit um, the networks that we've got to gain access to, not necessarily our data, but data that's crossing our networks that is of interest to them. And then the last one, which, is, which worries us all, right, is the insider threat. So, so we are as equally worried about the insider threat and, and people on the inside as we are uh, all some of those kind of external threats uh, that we face. And against that, uh, we have a number of other kind of drives that come in, you know, customer expectations. On the back of all the stuff we've seen with, with WannaCry, um, Stone Panda, APT10, all those sort of things, the volume of customer queries now about actually what are you doing about <laughs> this risk, that threat, all those sort of things are actually coming in thicker and faster. Um, helped, I must say, by our colleagues in NCSC who are starting to push more awareness out on, on all these sort of things as well. So there is a growing awareness, um, driving a greater volume of press in, uh, interest in all the cyber stories uh, that are going on. Um, and it's not forgetting as well, we have legal and regulatory requirements that we have to meet to protect our networks, to protect our customers, to protect our data and all that, and we've got, um, we've got GDPR coming in as well, which is driving even greater regulation in that space to protect uh, data. So lots of moving parts that we're kind of all worrying about from that perspective. So that's the wider landscape. I'll, I'll, let me get into a little BTism about it. So um, we have seen a significant increase ourselves in cyber incidents. This is a view of our um, P1 uh, classified security incidents. Um, and as you can see, 
if we wander back far enough in time, um, we kind of got to see one every few months. Um, that all changed about October 28, 2014, where actually we saw a, an increase, and, and now we're getting, uh, as you can see, an average that's around about six incidents a month. Um, the, it, it trends cyclically. Um, there's something in there about um, universities uh, finishing, going on holiday, dark nights, all that sort of stuff that seems to drive the, <laughs> the fluctuation. Um, kids getting bored at home, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, so we do see seasonal variation in the trends that we've, we've got. But actually, if we look overall, there is, a, there is an increase in what's going on. Um, and because in response to that increase, and I'll talk about it a little bit more as well, uh, you can see the green bars. The green bars are actually our proactive bits where we go out and try and find all the holes now before someone else finds them. Um, because we got so fed up of responding, we thought, well, let's, let's try and put our own hacker's mindset on and let's actually go out, let's go find out where all those issues are and let's go fix them. And that is the hard bit when we come to v6, and I'll talk about that briefly. So just to give an understanding about what, when we talk about protect BT, what do we mean, mean by protect BT? So our scope of all the things that, that yeah, I worry about in terms of ensuring that, that BT is safe and sound covers a whole range of things that actually you might not be aware of, of, uh, of, kind of some of those elements of stuff. So we start off kind of in the middle green about you know, some of our core network estate, the stuff that he, uh, Neil loves and spends lots of time on, uh, along with all his colleagues. Um, uh, moving out from that, a number of our subsidiaries um, and acquisitions, uh, colleagues in EE, we're in the, I see a number of our EE colleagues in the audience today, um, Plusnet and other subsidiaries we've got that may not be quite so obvious, so, uh, so I would like quoting Ticket. Does anyone know who Ticket is? BT people, don't put your hands up. No, no. No, ticket, legal advice, part of BT Group. So part of my responsibility to ensure that that organization is well protected. And then we've got our global business as well, domestic business that we've got outside of the UK. Uh, heavy use of cloud services. You know, how do we protect stuff where we're putting our data in someone else's cloud? Uh, how do we protect uh, the services where actually the services we operate, BT Vision, BT TV, all those services are heavily reliant on cloud services to make them work and function properly. So all part of that overall ecosystem of what a BT service is made up of. <coughs> and then we do a lot of um, services where we're doing outsource management for someone else's infrastructure. So again, from a protect BT perspective, we have standards we expect them to be applied to, and, and we worry just as much about protecting all of that sort of stuff and all that infrastructure as well. So um, I did say I would talk briefly about um, how we how we bringing some of that stuff together. So we're bringing and putting in place a part of our uh, investment that we're making under a program we call Citadel, um, an, intel uh, uh, an overall big data platform uh, driving us to bring data together, bring in external intelligence that we can do from a number of different sources, and use that to drive our security operations very much intelligence-led about you know, what's going on within those kind of threat actors we talked about, um, What's the uh, overall status and compliance of our networks, our platforms? Uh, what does all of that look like? And what are we seeing against real-time stuff that's happening now? Bringing all of that together and driving our uh, two views, essentially. One into our real-time operations uh, areas with the ability to kind of pick up and direct respond to, to the kind of here and now stuff that's happening. But as well as that, being able to bring all of that data together so that actually some of our advanced threat research team that we've got can spend time looking at actually what are the trends, what are the issues, where are things moving, how are things changing, um, you know, what, are the, what, what do we see as evolving threat out in the wider world, how does that evolving threat apply itself to BT's ex exposed footprint of what our, our networks look like to the wider world. Uh, and I tell you what, they are quite large and they are quite scary at times. Um, so bringing all that together so that we can actually drive our operations from kind of those kind of two clear views. Clicker doesn't always work. But it's not just about technology, right? So actually it's all about the organization as well as the technology that supports that. So we've moved our operational model. This is a view of, so, so if you come and talk to any of our uh, teams that are responsible uh, in the f just under 500 people that make this organization up as part of Protect BT, um, we talk about a three-box model in, in how we operate. Um, we uh, are an organisation that is very 
uh, risk driven in terms of, of how we operate. So we've got our whole team focusing on looking at risk, um, how we articulate risk to the wider BT, um, the policies that we have and how those policies should be executed uh, through uh, implementation. I know Richard will talk an awful lot about some of this sort of stuff as well um, from an NCSC perspective. Um, over on the right, uh, we have a set of teams that engage with our business. So uh, whether that's wholesale, uh, global services, business and public sector, actually the regional teams that we have globally as well. So you know, in, the, in the US, the EMEA, um, various different teams and how, kind of how we will engage in the, in the various different areas so we can bring some of that localization of security right into, uh, into how the business is operating. And then at the heart of that, um, we talk about a team which is the engine, which is kind of made up of four circles. There, are, there's, there is that white one that goes around the whole lot, which is intelligence. Um, and inside that, um, we've got kind of three key areas. So we have a, uh, our main operations team, cyber and physical op security operations, with physical and cyber now brought together. So actually, when we start to see someone abusing access to a building, or, but actually we can also see their, their credentials being used for remote, remote access at the same time. You know, that should spark us some worries and concerns that we should be responding to. Right? So, so we're not looking at physical and, and cyber in, in two distinct pillars. Um, a whole team, very much coloured red here, so you'll notice the red-blue elements of this slide, uh, that are responsible for our, our ethical hacking, penetration testing. Um, we do our own red teaming of our infrastructure and ourselves, and, and that's, that's quite a, uh, an interesting set of things that we tend to find as we do that. Uh, and then we have my team in the yellow, um, actually responsible for trying to drive security in by design. Um, but as well as the design piece, I've actually got a piece of work that we call Discovery, um, which is actually about trying to find BT asset wherever it exists in the internet and ensuring that actually that BT asset is secure um, and it's not uh, open to, uh, to hacking or any other issues. And it's that kind of view of that kind of global infrastructure that we've got and how it's exposed that we then kind of apply those threats to so that we can understand what risk we face on a day-by-day -day basis. And these are some of those trends, threats and trends and things that we see. So this is off our network. Um, this is not anyone else's data, this is BT data. Um, so uh, top left, you can see a view of uh, Telnet and SSH brute forcing uh, and the trends that we've seen over time. Um, big shift in growth here around all the IoT and Mirai. Uh, the one thing, despite the big peak that you can see on the right-hand side, and anyone's from scratching their heads, does that mean that botnets are getting bigger and we're going to get this big two terabit attack that everyone keeps talking about? The one thing we are seeing, actually, because we do, we do actually dive into all the individual botnets that we see in the infrastructure, is there's, a, there's an awful lot of fragmentation going in that space as well. So whilst there's a lot of endpoints now that are getting compromised, there are so many botnets, I don't think anyone could probably raise an attack now that's greater than two terabits a second. He says, touch wood, hoping. <laughs> Someone will now prove me wrong. Anyway, so, so that's, that's botnets um, and brute forcing of IPs and SSH. And I can actually, if you want, I can tell you what the most important, the most used usernames and passwords are as well because we capture all that stuff. And I can tell you Cisco, Cisco isn't in the top 10. <laughs> but please do secure your routers. Um, so, so telnet attacks, uh, bottom left. Uh, malware samples. So, so as part of all the stuff we're doing, we also collect malware samples. Um, and those are you know, tens of thousands of unique malware samples a day. You know, we keep talking about how can AV keep up in today's world. You look at those numbers and there's no way AV can keep anywhere near where the threats and the, th and the challenges that we are facing are moving. Big, big turn, big, big change. A lot of stuff we're doing in that kind of space. Um, and working across industry as well with, with organizations like Reversing Labs, take some of the malware, reverse it, get the attributes out, bring them back in so that we can then take indicators out of that. And we're trying to do an awful lot to share those indicators across the infrastructure industry. So if, if anyone's not using tools such as MISP and other stuff for sharing uh, technology, sticks, taxi type stuff, um, you really should be doing that. Um, if you want to know more, come talk to me about it because we're doing an awful lot to share stuff across the industry on that basis. And then on the right-hand side, all the right-hand side is all about spam. Um, uh, the, top, the top bit is all the things that we are seeing in terms of uh, spam originating uh, out from some of the infrastructure that we've got deployed. Um, the big drop-off was actually when the Kilios um, uh, botnet operator got um, arrested. 
So we have seen a big drop off in spam recently, um, which is quite, which is always good. Um, I'm sure it will grow again at some point when someone else decides to uh, to inject that volume of data into the uh, into the infrastructure again. And then just on the bottom right, uh, we can actually see the spam that we're seeing from the outside. This is not from our internal DN um, mail platforms. This is us measuring from the outside attacks that we are seeing targeting at BT from a from a spam perspective. Um, so if you want one for a view of your organization, I can generate yours as well. It's very easy. Right. Don't want to quite want to do that one yet. So I talked about global discovery. Ignore the slide for a second. Um, so as I said, one of the things we're doing from a global discovery perspective is spending an awful lot of time uh, going out, understanding actually what does the what does the risk exposure of BT look like to the to the outside world across the, the kind of millions of IPv4 addresses that, that BT owns. Uh, and I do actually on a regular basis go out and scan the whole of the internet trying to find BT asset in the whole of the internet uh, because you'd be surprised what people put on the back of a broadband line or something else. Um, yeah, I even caught Cisco running an unsecured Cisco device on the back of one of our broadband lines. Um, not to embarrass anyone else. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can, you can scan that, and we do scan that, and we are actually out there looking for, for BT stuff, and I can, you know, can tell you there's roughly around about 6,000 external IPs that BT services are exposed to the wider outside world over. That's not including all the broadband services and all the other stuff. That's our internal corporate estate. It's quite large from a global footprint perspective. The challenge, V6. So, so V4 is scannable. Look at that V6 number. You don't send a cat in hell's chance about scanning the V6 number, do you? So, yeah, that's going to be fun. Um, but it's part of the challenge that I've given to my team. How do we find BT stuff in V6 space? <laughs> so I'm waiting for Fernando's presentation later on because I'm hoping you're going to give me the answer. Yeah? <laughs> we'll, we'll see. But, but anyway, as Neil said, in, you know, we, have, we are doing, uh, we must be predicting my slide that was coming up. We, we have got V6 in BT. Um, so some slightly more smaller numbers if I was just to scan our own address space. <laughs> Scary still. No chance. Anyway, fair enough. Um, so what, what are we doing? So a little bit about some of the stuff we are doing in V6 to try and find stuff. Uh, it is a bit of a learning stuff for us. We've been doing this now for the past three or four months. Um, so we are using a number of open source tools that exist, IPv6 Walk. Um, the one thing that we have found is that actually where there are scanners out there, none of the scanning, none of the scanning tools are as well optimized in the V6 space as they are in the V4 space. So the performance of doing this sort of stuff in V6 is horrendous compared to doing it with V4. There's a lot of maturity needed in some of these tool sets to really get up to the, to the ability to even try and start doing any form of scanning in V6 at a sensible pace. Um, to spot things that actually are legitimately as in v6, well, of course, you can use your DNS records, right? Use your DNS records, go and find out what IPv addresses that you're responding to for your own domains. There you go, go scan them. Okay, cool. Inventory systems, wouldn't it be great if inventory systems were 100% accurate? Anyone in this room got an inventory systems 100% accurate? If you put your hand up, I know you're lying. <laughs> Ours aren't, right? Um, so, Yes, we can go and use our inventory systems that are a great start for 10, but actually yeah, they really do not help us in terms of finding stuff. I think over the course of the last two years while we've been, been doing uh, all of our discovery activity, uh, I've increased our ex view of our inventory by another 50% from what was formerly in our inventory systems that were e externally exposed to the internet. Um, we can then do other things, so passive DNS monitoring, that's a great way of doing stuff. Um, Capturing flow. So as a network provider, it's great for me because I can see the flows. If I find an IPv6 to address in users, right, can't I scan it back? That's really cool. Um, and then, of course, you've got other things. So, so pool.ntp.org, rumoured to hold a number of servers in there that are also malicious and used by the bad guys to try and find out what IPv6 is in use so they can scan it back and see if they can exploit it. We can use exactly the same sort of techniques that they're using to go and find uh, any servers that are also... Uh, talking in IPv6 uh, as well, registering with it, pull that NTP, and again, oh, found you, right, again, scan you and see how much of a risk you pose. So, I've left three minutes for questions, if I'm on time. A bit longer? Maybe a bit longer. So that's the end of my slides. Anyone got any questions around any of that point? Yeah. 
Hopefully I've left some thoughts for later on, if not. No? No questions? Oh. Just an IP4 for a moment. When you connect to a device that you determine to be BT... Just in the IP4 world, when you connect to a device, how would you actually determine it is a BT device? Yeah, so that's an interesting set of discussions. We can almost do a presentation on that in its own right. So, so there's a variety of different things we do. I mean, one, um, so you can look at, at, at headers, right? Telnet header, capture a telnet, just, yeah, because what all we're doing is connecting to a device and using its legit services. So, so telnet headers, uh, any form of headers around it, web, page, web, web headers. Um, uh, SSH is interested in SSL connections. You know, one thing to remember if you're doing an SSL connection is you want to do the TLS handshake first, and then you get a banner back. Um, some, of the, some of that handshaking works subtly differently. Um, so we, we go through all that process of doing the, doing the handshake, pull back, grab the header, grab that. excellent. Certificates, another great thing. Uh, you know, look at certificates. Um, some things, to be honest, we've only found because we then catch someone internally connecting to the IP address through our proxies. So proxy logs are great. If you think people are running services that you've got internally on the outside world, right, go look in your proxy logs for them. Excellent way of finding externally hosted stuff. You, most people wouldn't think about that approach. But we use that way. If, we find, if we've got something we don't know about um, and we're trying to find out where it is, we'll actually look at our proxy logs to see if there's any hints of BT using it anywhere, shape or form, that will give us some indication about what it might be. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions? Nope. Uh, so you mentioned your, your security platform, which obviously has lots of components to it. Are there aspects of that that um, uh, could be shared with, with other communities for them to use, or is it sort of very sort of directly tar tar you know, directed at, at your infrastructure? Uh, so the, the, the platform that we've got is very much directed at our in infrastructure internally. I mean, some of the tooling that we've used, I, I have um, kind of talked about that before, some of the techniques we're using around, you know, the... Um, the honey nets that we're operating, the way that we're scanning for stuff. Uh, some of the scanning stuff is, is our own proprietary stuff we've built. Most of it's built around open source, though. Um, you know, most of the components that we pull together are available off the shelf. So there's no reason why you, know, you couldn't pull the same sort of stuff together. Um, in terms of the, you know, the, the nice big pretty graphic about actually our intelligence-led big data lake way of doing it, that's a solution that we, are, we also sell to customers as well. So yeah, it, it's, it's not something we keep in private to to us, we can certainly come and talk about those sort of things. Dave. The other mic, come on, keep talking, I probably just need to slide it up. Um, have you seen any IPv6 distributed denial of service attacks yet? Uh, not DDoS attacks, no. Mm. Um, Do you have a view on why that is? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. So, so I, maybe a few theories. I mean, you know, some of the stuff in V6 isn't necessarily easy to find. Um, you know, if you're attacking a website, uh, to be honest, most of the endpoints that we're worrying about at the moment tend to be IPv4 orientated. Uh, so most of the attacks tend to come in at V4 rather than V6. Um, you know, I, I guess a lot of the things that we've got hosted for our customers are still very, very much V4 hosted rather than V6. And probably that's why we're not seeing a lot. Um, you know, if I were coming and talking about this from a from an Asia Pac perspective, you know, we might be seeing an awful lot more that's V6 orientated. But today we're not. Um, uh, we are seeing a lot of issues with V6 though. Um, I mean, one of the one of the just because I was going to actually point it out, and I missed, I forgot to to mention it. One of the key things that we are seeing from a V6 issues perspective, with some of the findings that we've been we've been making as we've been looking at stuff. Um, is where people have got great IPv4 addressed infrastructure. They put all the IPv4 security stuff around it, access control list, all the other stuff. I think, okay, we're going to dual stack it. We'll put V6 on. Forgot to put the V6 ACL. Forgot to do a range of other stuff. So actually, a number of the, you know, that's one of the biggest issues we're seeing with V6 rollout at the moment is just forgetting to add the extra security that you've added with V4 and putting it all on, on V6. It's not necessarily hard to do. Thank you. I'm going to pass that mic across. There's a question at the back, is there? As long as it's not from Phil. I'll, go first. I'll take this one first while we go. How's V6 uh, impacted information sharing with other agencies and other companies? Or has it yet at all? 
it's just an address, right? I, I, I don't think it makes a big difference in terms of information sharing. Um, you know, if we've got a V6 address that we've got a problem with, we'll share the V6 address as equal as we'll share the V4 address. Um, many of the tools that we've kind of got uh, around that do some of the sharing can, can deal with V6 as well as V4. So for us, it hasn't really been an issue. Um, the, I think the biggest challenge at the moment that we see is actually the challenge of finding stuff in V6 to report on it in the first place uh, and understanding where those threats exist. It's certainly not been a, a we, you know, in term, if you look at the volume of things that we've talked about from a V6 perspective compared to V4, um, you know, V6 is about 2% of the challenge. The, the, the rest of the stuff is still 98% of the dialogue is still in V4 kind of space. Do we find that other question? No. I used to work in inventory discovery in, in our PV4 world, and one of my conclusions was the only way to make that work is to mandate the devices identify themselves actively. Is that something you're looking at? It is something we're looking at to try and uh, improve our, dis our inventory systems that we've got. I mean, I guess part of the challenge that we, that we have internally, which we don't face externally so much, is you know, internally we domain our infrastructure off into lots of different security domains. Which then makes the challenge for discovery tools really difficult, right? You, you can't manage it like that. That's that's anti-security because it's unmanageable. Yeah, yeah. That that's. But it is that trade-off, isn't it? Is that yeah? You, know, you want uh, to no, do it's it not to, a trade-off. <laughs> if, if you well, can't manage it, it's not secure because you don't know what it is. No, no, no. I fully agree with that one. I fully agree with that one. We should know where all our stuff is, but then we should also have the right security protection around it. Um, and we do need to be able to ensure that that you know our discovery tools can reach through the infrastructure to get to it, and we shouldn't be hiding those ones away. But, it, but sometimes in, a, in, a, in an infrastructure that has been uh, as messy as ours is, with the number of acquisitions we've made over the years, um, actually with the volume of security domains that we've got globally is, is horrendous. So, so a quick win there could be to try to estimate how much the error is at the moment in what yeah. you've got, I think you've got, and what you, that can open up some eyes very quickly. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess it's one of the reasons why we've actually started doing our discovery from the outside rather than from the inside. So if we can go find stuff from the outside. Um, one that's exactly what the attackers are doing anyway. They're looking from the outside. They don't, they're not looking from the inside of our network, hopefully. Look. <laughs> um, so, so actually going from the outside uh, is, is easier anyway because there's no security barriers in place to stop me scanning the entirety of everything that we've got. One quan. Thanks. I was at the LoRa one, which is the low power wide area network, and BT was um, talking about their projects on farms, you know, bringing Internet of Things to farms. So I'm wondering if your uh, department is actively working with BT's IoT department you know, to ensure that. And can you give any insights into what you're doing differently to ensure that the problems you have with IPv4? are not um, replicated in IPv6. Yeah, so I think there's a, 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 a subtle challenge with IoT anyway, whether you were dealing with V4 or V6, um, especially when you're talking about some of the low-power devices and, and capabilities and low-power devices, right? Um, so we're actually we're heavily involved in the uh, IoT uh, security task force that's running. Um, we've got a number of, of individuals. In fact, one of, the, one of my team is involved in a, all the work we're doing around uh, IoT security standards um, that, that's working on. Um, I guess the, the challenge for us um, is I don't think the IoT, securing IoT is, is manageable just by focusing on the IoT device in its own right, right? Because we've got to deal with all the small devices that really have not got the capability to handle you know, all the, all the issues and challenges. And, you know, Neil was talking earlier about some of the challenges we've got with V6 rollout to some of our older home hubs. Well, they've got more processing capability than lots of the IoT devices. And we can't even get V6 dual stacked on them, how we expect them to, to secure themselves up. So for me, that's about how we put that into a wider context and ecosystem. You know, when we think about IoT deployed onto our networks, whether they be, uh, you know, our broadband networks or our mobile network infrastructure, uh, how, do we, how do we use that wider ecosystem to also then help to defend and protect all those IoT devices? So we're doing a lot of stuff um, with all our infrastructure around things like uh, our DNS platforms to help to 
um, remediate issues uh, in that sort of space to look at how we may well um, groom IoT devices to a, to a more secure portal. So, you know, thinking about um, developing portlet around, uh, you know, in our infrastructure that enables customers to manage IoT securely rather than just being rawly exposed to the internet. All those sort of things and considerations, I think, are all part of what we need to think about in this sort of world, rather than just try and say to everyone, go make your IoT device secure, because that isn't going to happen. My personal view. Yes. Yes. Sorry, the question was: uh, Am I concerned about um, a flaw in IoT devices and that being used to um, uh, kind of expand on that and and, uh, and and move around? So, absolutely. I think um, from our perspective, we've we've been concerned about that even from our home hub perspective, right? So, what, one of the big scary pieces was we've been trying to defend all of our stuff from the wider internet has been the back door. So what happens if someone can get a worm that exploits itself on a home hub and that can propagate around all their millions of subscribers? That's, that's a hefty weight of attack that can now come from my rear rather than from the front. Um, so, so yes, we are worried about all that sort of stuff. Um, it's why we've put a lot of effort in understanding what we are seeing about attacks trying to, trying to hit our customers. Um, you know, what does that mean to our customers? Um, in all the scanning that we do we, do, we are scanning our customer base as well. So if you are a BT customer, you do get scanned by me, unfortunately. But that's all so I can appraise the risk, right? I can understand you know, who's running open DNS resolvers, who's running you know, anything else that's potentially exposed that actually could then be an exploitation back. Um, and we are starting to do quite a piece of activity to reach out to our customers and talk to customers if we are seeing uh, anything malicious that's coming from, from kind of their home environments as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, which is part of the techniques about spine stuff, right? So I talked about using flow so we can see what's, what's communicating across our networks, use that to find the devices on the end and, and report back. Uh, obviously, in the home for IoT devices, the fact, you know, hopefully the consumer's still got a BT Home Hub. The BT Home Hub can tell us what's connected to it. It's great at doing that sort of stuff, and actually that, that enables us, again, uh, to have an understanding about what's available in the home. Um, we are actually looking at ways we can actually make the home hub even kind of more intelligent. What, what can the hub do in terms of potentially appraising security risk in the home environment and advising customers? All that sort of stuff is really kind of future thinking and future looking. You know, no commitment around that sort of stuff, but that's where some of our thinking is going about how can we actually help to secure the home in a better way. I'd much rather do that than have customers going out to Shodan, given they've got a dynamic IP saying, show me how vulnerable I am and getting yesterday's data from whoever had that IP address before them. 